The End of the Party by Graham Greene. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The End of the Party by Graham Greene. Peter Morton woke with a start to face the first light. Rain tapped against the glass. It was January the 5th. He looked across the table in which a nightlight had guttered into a pool of water at the other bed. Francis Morton was still asleep, and Peter lay down again with his eyes on his brother. It amused him to imagine it was himself whom he watched, the same hair, the same eyes, the same lips and line of cheek. But the thought passed, and the mind went back to the fact which lent the day importance. It was the 5th of January. He could hardly believe a year had passed since Miss Hen Falcon had given her last children's party. Francis turned suddenly upon his back and threw an arm across his face, blocking his mouth. Peter's heart began to beat fast, not with pleasure now, but with uneasiness. He sat up and called across the table, Wake up! Francis' shoulders shook, and he waved a clenched fist in the air, but his eyes remained closed. To Peter Morton, the whole room seemed to darken, and he had the impression of a great bird swooping. He cried again, Wake up! And once more there was silver light and the touch of rain on windows. Francis rubbed his eyes. Did you call out? he asked. You're having a bad dream, Peter said already experience had taught him how far their minds reflected each other. But he was the elder by a matter of minutes. In that brief extra interval of light, while his brother still struggled in pain and darkness, had given him self-reliance and an instinct of protection towards the other who was afraid of so many things. I dreamed that I was dead, Francis said. What was it like? Peter asked. I can't remember, Francis said. You dreamed of a big bird, did I? The two lay silent in bed facing each other, the same green eyes, the same nose tilting at the tip, the same firm lips, and the same premature modeling of the chin. The 5th of January, Peter thought again, his mind drifting idly from the image of cakes to the pies which might be won, egg and spoon races, spearing apples and basins of water, blind men's buff. I don't want to go, Francis said suddenly. I suppose Joyce will be there. Mabel Warren, hateful to him, the thought of a party shared with those two. They were older than he. Joyce was eleven and Mabel Warren, thirteen. The long pigtails swung superciliously to a masculine stride. Their sex humiliated him as they watched him fumble with his egg from under lowered scornful lids. And last year he turned his face away from Peter, his cheeks scarlet. What's the matter? Peter asked. Oh, nothing. I don't think I'm well. I've got a cold. I ought to not go to that party. Peter was puzzled. But Francis, is it a bad cold? It will be a bad cold if I go to the party. Perhaps I shall die. Then you must not go, Peter said, prepared to solve all difficulties with one plain sentence. And Francis let his nerves relax, ready to leave everything to Peter. But though he was grateful, he did not turn his face towards his brother. His cheek still bore the badge of a shameful memory of the game of hide-and-seek last year in the darkened house, and of how he had screamed when Mabel Warren put her hand suddenly upon his arm. He had not heard her coming. Girls were like that. Their shoes never squeaked. No boards whined under the thread. They slunk like cats on padded claws. When the nurse came in with hot water, Francis lay tranquil, leaving everything to Peter. Peter said, Nurse, Francis has got a cold. The tall, starched woman laid the towels across the cans and said, without turning, The washing won't be back till tomorrow. You must lend them some of your handkerchiefs. But, Nurse, Peter asked, hadn't he better stay in bed? We'll take him for a good walk this morning, the nurse said. Wind will blow away the germs. Get up now, both of you, and she closed the door behind her. I'm sorry, Peter said. Why don't you just stay in bed? I'll tell Mother you felt too ill to get up. But rebellion against destiny was not in Francis's power. If you stayed in bed, they would have come up and tapped 
his chest and put a thermometer in his mouth and look at his tongue and they would discover he was malingering it was true he felt ill a sick empty sensation in his stomach and a rapidly beating heart but he knew the cause was only fear fear of the party fear of being made to hide by himself in the dark uncompanioned by peter and with no night light to make a blessed breach no i'll get up he said and then with sudden desperation but i won't go to mrs hen falcon's party i swear on the bible i won't now surely all would be well he thought god would not allow him to break so solemn an oath he would show him a way there was all the morning before him and all the afternoon until four o'clock no need to worry when the grass was still crisp with the early frost anything might happen he might cut himself or break his leg or really catch a bad cold god would manage somehow he had such confidence in god that when at breakfast his mother said i hear you have a cold francis he made light of it we should have heard more about it his mother said with irony there was not a party this evening and francis smiled amazed and daunted by her ignorance of him his happiness would have lasted longer if out for a walk that morning he had not met joyce he was alone with his nurse for peter had to leave to finish a rabbit hutch in the woodshed if peter had been there he would have cared less the nurse was peter's nurse also but now it was as though she were employed only for his sake because he could not be trusted to go for a walk alone joyce was only two years older and she was by herself she came striding towards them pigtail flapping she glanced scornfully at francis and spoke with ostentation to the nurse hello nurse are you bringing francis to the party this evening mabel and i are coming and she was off again down the street in the direction of mabel warren's home consciously alone and self-sufficient in the long empty road such a nice girl the nurse said but francis was silent feeling again the jump jump of his heart realizing how soon the hour of the party would arrive god had done nothing for him and the minutes flew they flew too quickly to plan any evasion or even to prepare his heart for the coming ordeal panic nearly overcame him when all unready he found himself standing on the doorstep with coat collar turned up against the cold wind and nurse's electric torch making a short trail through the darkness behind him were the lights of the hall and the sound of a servant laying the table for dinner which his mother and father would eat alone he was nearly overcome by the desire to run back into the house and call out to his mother that he would not go to the party that he dared not go they could not make him go he could almost hear himself saying those final words breaking down forever the barrier of ignorance which saved his mind from his parents knowledge i'm afraid of going i won't go i dare not go they'll make me hide in the dark and i'm afraid of the dark i'll scream and scream and scream he could see the expression of amazement in his mother's face and then the cold confidence of a grown-up's retort don't be silly you must go you accepted mrs hen falcon's invitation but they could not make him go hesitating on the doorstep while the nurse's feet crunched across the frost-covered glass to the gate he knew that he, he would answer you can say i mill i won't go i'm afraid of the dark and his mother don't be silly you know there's nothing to be afraid of in the dark but he knew the falsity of that reasoning he knew how they taught also that there was nothing to fear in death and how fearfully they avoided the idea of it but they could not make him go to the party i'll scream i'll scream francis come along he heard the nurse's voice across the dimly phosphorescent lawn and saw the yellow circle of her torch wheel from tree to shrub i'm coming he called with despair he couldn't bring himself to lay bare the, his last secrets and and reserve between his mother and himself for there still was in the last resort a further appeal possible to mrs Han falcon he comforted himself with that as he advanced steadily across the hall very small towards her enormous bulk his heart beat unevenly but he had control now over his voice as he said with meticulous accent good evening mrs Han falcon it was very good of you to ask me to your party 
with his strained face lifted towards the curve of her breast and his polite speech set he was like an old withered man as a twin he was in many ways an only child to address peter was to speak to his own image in a mirror an image a little altered by a flaw in the glass so as to throw back less a likeness of what he was than of what he wished to be what he would be without his unreasoning fear of darkness footsteps of strangers the flight of bats in dusk-filled gardens sweet child said mrs han falcon absent-mindedly before with a wave of her arms as though the children were a flock of chickens she whirled them into her program of entertainment egg and spoon races three-legged races the spearing of apples games which held for francis nothing worse than humiliation and in frequent intervals when nothing was required of him and he could not stand alone in corners as far removed as possible from mabel warren's scornful gaze he was able to plan how he might avoid the approaching terror of dark he knew there was nothing to fear until after tea and not until he was sitting down on a pool of yellow radiance cast by the tan candles of colin han falcon's birthday cake did he become fully conscious of the imminence of what he feared he heard joyce's high voice down the table after tea we're going to play hide and seek in the dark oh no peter said watching francis's troubled face don't let's we play that every year but it's in the program cried mabel warren i saw it myself i looked over mrs hen falcon's shoulder five o'clock tea a quarter to six to half past hide and seek in the dark it's all written down in the program peter did not argue for if hide and seek had been inserted in mrs hen falcon's program nothing which she could say would avert it he asked for another piece of birthday cake and sipped his tea slowly perhaps it might be possible to delay the game for a quarter of an hour allow francis at least a few extra minutes to form a plan but even in that peter failed for children were already leaving the table in twos and threes it was the third failure and again he saw a great bird darken his brother's face with its wings but he upbraided himself silently for his folly and finished his cake encouraged by the memory of that adult refrain there is nothing to fear in the dark the last to leave the table the brothers came together to the hall to meet the mustering and impatient eyes of mrs han falcon and now she said we will play hide and seek in the dark peter watched his brother and saw the lips tighten francis he knew had feared this moment from the beginning of the party had tried to meet meet it with courage and had abandoned the attempt he must have prayed for cunning to evade the game which was now welcomed with cries of excitement by all the other children oh do let's we must pick sides is any of the house out of the bounds where shall home be i think said francis morton approaching mrs han falcon his eyes focused unwaveringly on her exuberant breath it will be no use my playing my nurse will be calling for me very soon oh but your nurse can wait said mrs han falcon while she clapped her hands together to summon to her side a few children who were already straying up the wide staircase to upper floors your mother will never mind that had been the limit of francis's cunning he had refused to believe that so well prepared an excuse could fail all that he could say now still in the precise tone which the other children hated thinking it a symbol of conceit was i think i had better not play he stood motionless retaining though unafraid unmoved features but the knowledge of his terror or the reflection of the terror itself reached his brother's brain for the moment peter morton could have cried aloud with the fear of bright lights going out leaving him alone in an island of dark surrounded by the gentle lappings of strange footsteps then he remembered that the fear was not his own but his own but his brother's he said impulsively to mrs han falcon please i don't think francis should play the dark makes him jump so they were the wrong words six children began to sing cowardly cowardly custard turning torturing faces with the vacancy of wide sunflowers towards francis morton without looking at his brother francis said of course i'll play i'm not afraid i only thought but he was already forgotten by his human tormentors the children scrambled round mrs han falcon their shrill voices pecking at her with questions and suggestions yes anywhere in the house we will turn out all the lights yes you can hide in the cupboard you must stay hidden as long as you can there will be no home 
peter stood apart ashamed of the clumsy manner in which he had tried to help his brother now he could feel creeping at the corners of his brain all francis's resentment of his championing several children ran upstairs and the lights on the top floor went out darkness came down like the wings of a bat and settled on the landing others began to put out the lights at the edge of the hall till the children were all gathered in the central radiance of the chandelier while the bats squatted round on hooded wings and waited for that to be extinguished you and francis are on the hiding side a tall girl said and when the light was gone and the carpet wavered under his feet with the sibilance of footfalls like small called trots creeping away into corners where's francis he wondered if i join him he'll be less frightened of all these sounds these sounds were the casing of silence the squeak of a loose board the cautious closing of a cupboard door the whine of a finger drawn along polished wood peter stood in the centre of the dark deserted floor not listening but waiting for the idea of his brother's whereabouts to enter his brain but francis crouched with fingers on his ears eyes uselessly closed mind numbed against impressions and only a sense of strain could cross the gap of dark then a voice called coming and as though his brother's self-possession had been shattered by the sudden cry peter morton jumped with his fear but it was not his own fear what in his brother was a burning panic was in him an altruistic emotion that left the reason unimpaired where if i were francis should i hide and because he was if not francis himself at least a mirror to him the answer was immediate between the oak bookcase on the left of the study door and the leather settee between the twins there could be no jargon or telepathy they had been together in the womb and they could not be parted peter morton tiptoed towards francis's hiding place occasionally a board rattled and because he feared to be caught by one of the soft questers through the dark he bent and untied his laces a tag struck the floor and the metallic sound said a host of cautious feet moving in his direction but by that time he was in his stockings and would have laughed inwardly at the pursuit had not the noise of someone stumbling on his abandoned shoes made his heart tip no more boards revealed peter morton's progress on stockings feet he moved silently and unerringly towards his object instinct told him he was near the wall and extending a hand he laid the fingers across his brother's face francis did not cry out but the leap of his own heart revealed to peter a proportion of francis's terror it's all right he whispered feeling down the squatting figure until he captured a clenched hand it's only me i'll stay with you and grasping the other tightly he listened to the cascade of whispers his utterance had caused to fall a hand touched the bookcase close to peter's head and he was aware of how francis's fear continued in spite of his presence it was less intense more bearable he hoped but it remained he knew that it was his brother's fear and not his own that he experienced the dark to him was only an absence of light the groping hand that of a familiar child patiently he waited to be found he did not speak again for between francis and himself was the most intimate communion by way of joined hands thought could flow more swiftly than lips could shape themselves round words he could experience the whole progress of his brother's emotion from the leap of panic and the unexpected contact to the steady purse of fear which now went on and on with the regularity of a heartbeat peter morton thought with intensity i'm here you need not be afraid the lights will go on again soon that rustle that movement is nothing to fear only joyce only mabel warren he bombarded the drooping form with thoughts of safety but he was conscious that the fear continued they're beginning to whisper together they're tired of looking for us the lights will go on soon. we shall have one don't be afraid that was someone on the stairs i, be I believe it's mrs Hen falcon listen they're feeling for the lights feet moving on a carpet hands brushing a wall a curtain pulled apart 
a clicking handle, the opening of a cupboard door, in the case above their heads, a loose book shifted under a touch. Only Joyce, only Mabel Warren, only Mrs. Han Falcon, a crescendo of reassuring thought before the chandelier bust like a fruit tree into bloom. The voice of the children rose shrilly into the radiance. Where's Peter? Have you looked upstairs? Where's Francis? But they were silenced again by Mrs. Han Falcon's scream. But she was not the first to notice Francis Morton's stillness, where he had collapsed against the wall at the touch of his brother's hand. Peter continued to hold the clenched fingers in the narrowed and puzzled grief. It was not merely that his brother was dead. His brain, too young to realize the full paradox, wondered with an obscure self-pity why it was that the pulse of his brother's fear went on and on when Francis was now where he had always been told there was no more terror and no more darkness. The end of the end of the party.